So Robin Hood was founded 10 years ago with a mission to make, uh, uh, to give everybody access, right, to the trading markets. And then since then, it's grown to be much more than that. Now you can trade crypto, you can save for retirement, and you can do a lot of stuff on there. To talk to us about the challenges that still remain, we have CEO Vlad Tenet here, and we will be speaking with moderate, moderator Ramon Dillette. Thank you, and let's welcome them to the stage. <laughs> Vlad, it's always great to have you here at Disrupt. Thanks for having me, Roman. It's the first time. You told me it's the third time, right? I think so, although it's been a couple of years. I joined you guys in New York once and once yeah, before yeah. in San Francisco when we were a very small company. Yeah, and it's been 10 years since you created Robinhood. At first, the mission was pretty clear. It was, you can trade stocks without any commission, commission-free trading. It's a very basic and simple mission everybody could understand. Since then, you've launched dozens of products, so many products, it's hard to keep track. Earlier this summer, you announced that you acquired X1, a credit card company. That's right. You launched crypto trading, of course, retirement savings, uh, a way to earn interest on, on, on cash uh, with Robinhood Gold. How would you describe the mission statement for Robinhood today? Yeah, well, the mission of Robinhood is broader. It's to democratize finance for all. And the idea that we had when we started it, which, which I think is very, very powerful today, is that um, if, you're, if you're someone that is privileged in, in the US, you have access to all sorts of things. Like institutions have access to trade unlimited amounts, uh, commission free. Uh, you get access to excellent wealth management. You don't have to worry as much for saving for retirement. You get access to credit at affordable rates and with great rewards. And um, there's sort of these high barriers of entry. In brokerage, it's either account minimums or high account balances to qualify for premium services. And Robinhood wants to lower the barrier, uh, both in terms of the user experience and the accessibility and also the value. So if you hear about a Robinhood product being released to market, it should be very, very clear to you that you're getting the best possible deal and the user experience is gonna be of the highest possible quality. And of course, we started, as you pointed out, with trading and investing, but more recently, we've been helping customers with their comprehensive set of financial needs. So we see a world where, um, we can not only help you trade, but we can help you save for retirement, and we can help you build up an emergency fund, and we can help you sort of manage your money holistically, regardless of, of what stage you are, and, and really help you achieve your financial goals. And um, I think that's, that's been really resonating with customers, and customers are kind of pulling all of these additional products and services out of us. So trading, it's, it's elite, as you said. Crypto, it's edgy. Retirement, it's weird, I guess. I wouldn't because call it weird. I don't um, know if it fits with the demo of Robinhood users. Um, I think that retirement is something that everyone aspires to, right? A lot of the first, um, a lot of people's first introduction to retirement is through an employer-sponsored 401k, and that's also for a lot of people their first kind of introduction to investing. Um, that said, the nature of work is changing. You know, you, you run into a lot of people that don't want to work at a traditional employer. They don't want to feel like, you know, they're, they're a cog in a machine at some big company, and having losing access to a 401k, which has traditionally been the most important vehicle driving retirement, um, is kind of a consequence of that. So if you're an entrepreneur, uh, if you're someone that wants to work for yourself, then you don't really benefit as much from something like a 401k. 
And so Robinhood released a product, which is the first IRA with a match. And it's really for people that want to manage uh, their retirement themselves. They don't want to rely on an employer to do it because they're sort of like self-driven, they're solo entrepreneurs or, or entrepreneurs themselves. And uh, using kind of our economics and our efficiency, we can give them a match similar to how an employer would via 401k, but uh, without, without needing the employer. Bring us, best, bring us back to the meeting room when, when you were talking about the roadmap and you were like, okay, we can launch this, that, or retirement. Why did you prioritize retirement over other potential products? Because we saw a big need. It was actually something that um, probably we, we started hearing about from customers four years ago or so. Um, and we do a lot of live customer research. I think it's somewhat rare for a financial company because a lot of our competitors tend to just look at what competitors are doing and, and build products that way. Which one? But uh, uh, the vast majority of them. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we would go across the country and talk to customers in their homes, right? Whether they be options traders or you know, uh, people that are building up investment portfolios for the first time. And everyone uh, actually was, was talking about investing in the context of long-term goals that they want to achieve, retirement being a very, very important one. And so we asked ourselves, like, how, how can we actually make a retirement product that's not just another account type that you select when you're creating a Robinhood account? How can we make it so that we actually show that Robinhood's gonna help you not just open an account and, and start investing, but, but reach your, your dream uh, to retire? And so we started like figuring out that this idea of compounding is very, very important. You know, if, if you put uh, $6,500 away every single year, and Robinhood is capable of matching that, and you do that year after year, um, that adds up to real money, tens of thousands of additional dollars. And just communicating that visually and making it clear how our offering can help people achieve that end goal. Um, well, once we kind of figured that out, we realized that we had a special product for people. And to see that grow to over a billion in assets in the first couple of months, um, I think it's been... It's, it's been really, really important for Robinhood and for our customers, and I think it shows us that we can help people not just trade and invest, but like achieve uh, really important long-term goals as well. And do you think Robinhood is the right brand for retirement savings, given that people associate Robinhood with you know, very instant trades uh, on the market right now, like every day? Do you think it's the right brand? I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I think brands and products are more connected than people think. Um, so, of course, the brand influences what kind of products people are receptive to, but the products influence the brand as well. Mm. So, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I think a few years ago, it probably wouldn't have made sense because we didn't have a retirement product. So um, even though we built all of these tools like recurring investments that allowed you to, to build up and, and produce these diversified portfolios, not a lot of people would take uh, Robinhood seriously for long-term investing. I mean, the same tools and kind of economic benefit of no commissions that make it a no-brainer to be a trader, also make it a no-brainer to build a portfolio and, and become sort of a passive long-term investor. Um, but when we rolled out retirement, now we're seeing Robinhood uh, being mentioned and discussed in all sorts of other forums, like Bogleheads or passive investing forums on Reddit, where, you know, Robinhood was probably considered more of a toy product, but now people are saying, well, look, we're an incredibly rational group of people. Uh, we know how compound interest works. This match, uh, starting at 1%, and now we're offering 3% for our gold members, 
is just an unbeatable deal. So you have people saying, like, we just can't ignore this anymore. The value prop is so strong. And you're seeing more and more of that discussion happening across all these forums. And I think over time, that'll actually change the brand, right? Like, uh, it will become uh, a brand that transcends just active investing and novice investing. Talking about forums and Reddit, I have to mention the GameStop short squeeze at this point. Did you build this product as a reaction to what happened in early 2021 when the short squeeze happened and you couldn't process orders? No, um, no we were thinking about it before then. I think the, the reality was uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, Robinhood went through a lot of growth. Uh, it was a surprising amount of growth. I mean, there were some days in early 2021 where we processed you know, 20 million trades per day, like tens of billions wow. of, of traded volume, right? And uh, like the, the volume increased three to four X month over month. Um, and the product roadmap, I think unfortunately took a backseat during those days. I think the most important thing was just making sure that we were stable, like we, Scale, were, yeah. we were scaling, we could actually like handle the, the demands on the business. So, um, yeah, I think we, we did, uh, we made a lot of progress and now, you know, the customer support, the infrastructure, the, the reliability of it improved dramatically. Um, and as we kind of got out of that into the new regime of high interest rates, we've been able to focus again on kind of accelerating the product roadmap. But 2021 and 2020, in 2020, we were sort of focused on different things. And now that the dust has settled a bit, can you bring us back to the moment when you realized that things were going sideways during the GameStop short squeeze and you wouldn't be able to process orders? Did you receive a phone call? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was definitely a, a stressful day. Uh, I hadn't gotten much sleep because... Um, we, we had had our moments of instability and kind of service reliability issues in 2020. And I think we felt really good that we had moved past that, right? Um, we had just had the election, which traditionally is a very volatile time. And a lot of our major competitors actually had outages and, and Robinhood stayed up through that time. Um, but then early 2021 brought a crazy amount of activity and, um, sort of the, the issues that we had with uh, processing those trades definitely made a lot of customers uh, unhappy. But at, at some point, you had, to, you had to make a call, say, okay, let's stop everything? Well, um, so the way it works is because, um, because I'm not a, a licensed broker, mm -hmm. I have presidents of the brokers that... Uh, that run kind of the, the regulated entities. So, um, you know, Jim, who was uh, the president of Robinhood Securities, our clearing firm, actually was the one that, that made the decision. Um, but yeah, I think it was, it was incredibly difficult in the sense that we know customers were, were not happy. And, you know, I play it back through my head lots of times since that moment. Um, but we had no choice. I think the alternative would have been much worse. Um, and of course, I know it's uh, not satisfying for people who were you know, interested in trading GameStop that day and things like that. But um, what, what we can do is learn from it and, and make sure that we improve the service and focus on providing great value and shipping more products to customers. Do you think Robinhood now is rock solid and it wouldn't happen again? Um, we've made a ton of progress, so I, I feel very, very confident that if the same situation occurred, um, we would be, you know, across the board, much better equipped to, to handle it. And you've launched new features around stock trading as well, is that right? Oh, plenty. Um, so one of the things that I think we learned from the crypto markets is um, crypto has operated pretty well, 24-7, uh, round the clock. You know, you can, you can buy Bitcoin and any other cryptocurrency. They settle instantly. And um, 
I think bringing the experience and kind of the accessibility of that to the traditional markets is something that is, is like very clearly uh, the future. So earlier this year, we've rolled out 24-hour market, which is basically a way for customers to trade uh, top individual stocks and ETFs um, around the clock, uh, except on weekends. And we've, we've been expanding that offering. Now it's close to 100 individual stocks and ETFs, including many of the most commonly traded ones. And um, I think it's, it's just another example of how Robinhood wants to push the industry and be at the forefront of providing tools and technology for traders and investors. And it's also something that I think paves the way for us to expand the product internationally. I mean, if, if you're in, in Europe or Asia, the overlap of your waking hours with kind of standard East Coast working hours is pretty small. So for those customers, 24-hour uh, trading is even more important because, you know, it's like going to a store that's op only open while you're sleeping. It just doesn't make sense. The experience is not quite there, and, and that makes it less accessible to people. Yeah, talking about international markets, you, you've teased for quite a while that you were going to launch in the UK. When is that going to happen? That's going to happen uh, in the next few months. So you're, you're definitely right. Uh, it's one of those things that it was planned for 2020, but when COVID happened and we were focused on scaling and making sure we were there for the customers that we had, we had to, to delay it a little bit. And it was painful, and uh, uh, unfortunately, it was, I think, the, the right decision. But now we're coming to the UK with a much better product, much better tools, and much better uh, offering across the board. So I'm very excited to bring the best of American markets to, to the UK market and, and really become a, a critical part of, of our customers' financial experience. And after the there. UK, do you have other plans for other markets? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think that it's, it's really just the beginning. I mean, we've, uh, since the last time I was here at Disrupt, we've grown tremendously. We were a small private company then, now we're a public company. Um, but we're still only in the U.S. and we're still starting to like take our first steps outside of novice trading and active trading. Um, I think that in addition to rolling out all sorts of products to help customers manage their money here, we can expand uh, overseas. And as a technology company, I think we have certain advantages that our competitors can't match. We don't need a ton of brick and mortar. Um, we rely on automation to, uh, to provide a lot of the services that we offer. And so we can take the infrastructure that we're building and now expanding to the UK to expand to Europe, to Asia, and, and really to make it so that anyone with a smartphone can access Robinhood's product and services, and we can help them achieve their financial goals at the lowest possible cost and with you know, the same delightful experience that customers have come to understand us with stock trading here. Yeah, let's, let's switch gear a, a bit. You mentioned that you're a public company now. Um, before that, you, you had some large individual investors. Um, one of them was Sam Backman fried He owned, I think, 7% of the company, and you bought back his share uh, recently because he's no longer an investor in, in, in the company. We that's, did, yeah, that's right. That's, that's a really good friend you had here. Do you know him personally? Um, I've had a couple of conversations with him, but I, I wouldn't say I know him super well, no. So how did he get in touch with you and, and, and expressed interest in Robinhood and buying a stake in Robinhood? Well, to be clear, um, I think his, his entity, um, and this is all very, very complicated, Emergent Fidelity Shares uh, was the entity behind Sam Bankman-Fried's uh, investment. They just purchased shares, to my knowledge, on the open market once we were public. So, you know, when, when you're a public company, anyone can buy shares. Uh, you can buy shares. I mean, uh, the, uh, there's, there's really, I'm not in the middle of those, of those transactions. Um, and so I, th I think that's what ended up happening. They were just buying shares on the open market. 
to and, the best of my knowledge. And when did you decide that you didn't want him as an investor anymore? Well, I think that um, once you know the all the issues with FTX happen in November and um, sort of uh, the state went through bankruptcy proceedings and and went through the courts, um, we just saw an opportunity to remove sort of the the overhang and the distraction and we have the the balance sheet to be able to do that comfortably you know uh with over six billion in cash um we saw an opportunity to kind of not just remove that distraction but sort of deploy that capital to lower the number of outstanding shares and it was sort of a win-win like good for us but but also good for shareholders do you think at some point he, it would have been even more interconnected, it could have been even more interconnected between FTX and Robinhood, and that they could have basically bought Robinhood? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, it's obviously you know, before, before everything difficult happened, to rewind uh, time and, uh, and assume uh, any of these things, but uh, Beju and I were, from the very beginning, very, very passionate about building a public company that uh, could outlast us, right, would be around for hundreds of years with the ideals of like, not just providing a great product, but really putting money back in customers' pockets. Um, and I think we've just, we've taken like one or two steps there, but uh, there's just so much left to do. and. That's why I'm, I'm so passionate about all these things, like not just retirement, but getting Robinhood in every single country, uh, getting super deep and helping customers with like every aspect of their financial needs, not, their, not just their trading. Um, and I, I think there's just much to do. So yeah, it, it, it never really even occurred to us, And to it honest. sounds like you're well positioned for the long term, given high interest rates. Uh, you can you know, create savings products and, and benefit from these high interest rates. Do you have a plan in mind if the interest rates go down? You know, it's really funny because uh, I'd say a year and a half ago when interest rates were zero, yeah. uh, there was this whole thing like a zero interest rate phenomenon, right? And um, the, the bulk of Robinhood's revenue was transaction-based and the criticism behind Robinhood was, well, you've done really well when there's like stimulus going into the market, interest rates have been zero, so people are investing in stocks more. What's gonna happen when interest rates go up? It was one of the most common questions. Mm. And it's taken a lot of work over the past year and a half, but we've transformed the company entirely. And the way we, we went about doing that is we saw the increasing interest rates as an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of companies that have thrown up their hands and they're saying, you know, we're just gonna like weather the storm and wait for the markets to improve. The Fed's gonna cut interest rates eventually. Like it's a, a bad time to be I a don't mortgage. I going to happen anytime soon anyway, so. Right, I mean, it's, it's a bad time to be like a mortgage lender right now, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. But um, we didn't take that approach. We were like, these are high interest rates. This is an opportunity for us. How can we serve our customers? And we rolled out uh, Robinhood Gold, which offers customers among the highest possible yields on their cash. Right now you're getting 4.9% here uh, in US dollars, which in the past you would have to be an institutional investor. I mean, to get that type of rate at like a traditional brokerage firm, you would need you know, millions of dollars committed in your account. And we're just making that available to, to everyone. And of course, following that up with all the work that we've done for, for active traders, retirement, um, it's kind of transformed the financial picture of the company to one where rather than 80, 90% of our revenue coming from transactions, uh, more than half comes from net interest margin, so interest that we collect on assets. And we've been able to do that while also putting more money in our customers' pockets through high yield and, and through retirement. So it's, it's taken a lot of work but um, I think the work we've done is kind of diversified Robinhood and, and made us a stronger company that can weather all kinds of different market conditions from zero interest rates to crypto the current winter. environment. So yeah, let, let's say, let's come back to what happened over the past three years. 
there was a crypto boom, now it's a crypto winter. Um, stock trading was really popular during and after COVID, now less so because of high interest rates. Do you think you've found a way to create predictable revenue quarter after quarter, and as a public company, it's going to be easier going forward? Well, if you look at financial performance of the company, um, we've had you know, positive and growing free cash flow four quarters in a row. Um, we had our first gap profitable yeah, last quarter, quarter right? last quarter, um, which is a huge milestone. I mean, it took, took a lot of work. Um, is it going but, to be the same this quarter, gap profitability? I can't make any, any predictions about the quarter. Uh, Otherwise, the SEC is going to. Yeah, nice try. <laughs> nice try, Roman. Um, <laughs> But I'm just asking questions. You know. I'll tell you over the long run, um, you know, we're, we're still in the U.S. We're just beginning our, our path to offering more products to customers. You alluded to credit. So yeah. we, we, made, uh, we acquired a, an awesome team, X1, X1. Um, that has a great credit card. And we've been thinking about that space for a while. And if, if you think about like, where there's a lot of opportunity in financial services, consumer credit and offering those products to customers, making them more useful. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity for us. And we see that, we hear that from our customers. So um, yeah, long term, uh, we're still in kind of the, the first inning of our journey. All right, so when can we expect a Robinhood credit card? Uh, I know the, the team has been working very, very hard uh, on that. So uh, stay tuned in the next few months? I, I can't say anything specific, but uh, yeah, I won't not say anything either. Well, thank you for the <laughs> conversation. Stay nimble as Robin Hood. Keep pivoting until you find a way out. And thank you, Vlad, for being here. <laughs> thank you.